So the summer between my junior and my senior year of high school is one of the most defining moments of my life. It's the summer that I went on my very first mission trip as a newly minted Christian. It was interesting, our youth pastor had given out these little New Testament Bibles and my buddy and I had grabbed one. And on this mission trip, we began to read through it for the very first time. The youth pastor, his name is Dan, and he's been a a, a lifelong friend of mine. And uh, he had said to us, you know, just find something in there to read. And then after we had read one of the books, I think it was the, the Gospel of John, he said, guess what? You and your friend, my friend Dylan, you're going to be small group leaders, and you're going to start teaching other people about the Bible. To which we were like, we only just read one book in it. You want us to teach other people? And he said, yeah, you'll figure it out. Now listen, if you are sitting here going, the pastors in the past, maybe even the one who's in the present, have asked us to lead, and I don't have enough knowledge. Don't worry, you'll just figure it out. We'll get there at a later date and time. Going into my senior year, I began to feel a calling on my life to ministry. That God was saying, I am positioning you amongst a certain group of people at a certain place so that you can learn about your purpose. You see, I was in Boca amongst an amazing church family and given the opportunity to, after high school, come on as an intern and learn what it means to be in pastoral ministry. And my freshman year of college... I am now working full-time for no pay. Good deal, right? Full-time, no pay. However, the church uh, was giving me and a couple of my buddies who were in this internship program scholarship money to begin attending correspondingly, through correspondence, with Liberty University up in Virginia. Liberty at the time, and still today, is like one of the largest Christian schools So they mailed us VHS tapes, and for our kids, a VHS had, y'all know what a VHS is, right? They're like, no, not a clue. We'll talk about it later. They they mailed us these VHS tapes, and it was kind of fuzzy, and I remember sitting there with my little cohort, there's like four or five of us, and we're watching the professor lecture us on a videotape. So my my calling into ministry started with, with schooling. The church that I was at had a relationship with a seminary in Orlando, so in addition to going to Liberty, my friends and I, we began to attend RTS, Reformed Theological Seminary of Orlando. And as I got my uh, syllabus for the class, first seminary-level class I took as a freshman, although they told us you can be in the class, but you can't count it for credit, it was just for our own edification, So I'm reading the syllabus, and it said, you need a study Bible. Believe it or not, I didn't own a study Bible. I had that little New Testament that was given to me that I began to read through, and I read through the whole thing. I highlighted the whole thing, and I I read from cover to cover the New Testament, and I started to read through the Old Testament, read the whole thing cover to cover at one point in my life, but now I needed to get a study Bible. So I went out to the family Christian bookstore, and I bought this Bible. I keep it in a little case now because I used it so much it's literally falling apart. You can see that here. Hold on. I'll prove it. So it was interesting. I went out and I bought this Bible. I didn't know anything about it. It was, you know, they said get an NIV study Bible. So I grabbed this one. You know, God has a sense of humor, right? 
because I started reading through this study Bible, and it's got articles by different pastors and leaders, and I was seeing names like Joanne Lyons. And she, is, she was, at the time, the uh, general superintendent of the Wesleyan denomination, which is a sister denomination of the Methodist denomination. I saw articles in there by Bud Bentz and Steve Lennox, who were all professors that I would go on to have in about a year or so when I transferred to Indiana Wesleyan. It was amazing how I was beginning to see the path and the purpose that God had for my life, even through little things of how God was opening and closing doors and God was strategically placing me amongst a certain people in a certain place for a certain purpose. I began to walk through that path And I began to realize that my purpose for life really kind of revolved around three themes. Get up, get going, and get preaching. Now, I want to challenge us this morning, church, that that's not a purpose for me alone. Because I'm called to pastoral ministry, it's not just for me. It's for all of us. We all have this calling on our lives, whether we are young or old, whether we are still working or we are retired, whether we are nearing uh, aging out and seeing Jesus, or we still have many years ahead of us, we all still have this purpose in our life, to get up, to get going, and to get preaching. You might not know everything in the Bible from cover to cover, but if you know your Lord and Savior, you are a living testimony, and your testimony can bring about transformation in the lives of other people. We've said it over the last two years that I've been here that as we we pause for a moment and we look around this space, so join me, let's pause for a moment, let's look around, we we see uh, some family over here, we'll wave to our family over there, and we see some around us and around us. But we also see some empty spaces. And I've said for two years that every empty spot represents someone in our community who is far from the love of Christ. And you and I have an opportunity to be bringers, bringing people to fill space, to engage with family, to hear the gospel to see lives transformed and hope given and and the goodness of God overwhelm because we are those who can fill the space with people who are in desperate need of Jesus. I was sharing recently some statistics. You you ready for some statistics? That's the only kind of math I like. Baseball, right? When it comes to people coming to church for the very first time, they, they showed a breakdown of what it looked like uh, for somebody who came to church for the first time. 3% of people who go to church for the first time do so because of advertising, because they saw it in the newspaper, or they saw it on Facebook, or they heard it on the radio. 3% of people. It was about 1% of people who drive by and see the building and go, yeah, I'll give that a try. It was about 3% of the people that came for the very first time because the pastor invited them. And it was about 80 some odd percent, if you do the math, I think it's what, three, three and one, that's seven. So it's 83% or 93% of the people who come for the very first time come because somebody invited them. The only thing standing between some of the people in our community Coming to church and being a part of it is the invitation from us. Hey, here's a challenge. Maybe today we could get up, get going, and get preaching. We're in this teaching series called Playlist, where we're hearing some different music, and for us this morning, this may be very different, and, and I hope you enjoy as best you can. But last week, we, we, had, we heard a song by Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors called Find Your People, And we talked about our need for community. Well, this morning, I want to introduce to you a song by Andy Grammer called Born for This. And as we begin to talk about this morning, our purpose. So go ahead, take a moment and listen to this. I was born for 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 this right here. 
Say it till the doubt disappears I feel like an imposter, yeah Ain't nobody caught me, yeah Playing hide and seek, yeah Hoping you don't see that I'm making this up as I go Hold up Who deserve this more than me? Your target's open on the street Been fighting since I'm 17 Don't know no other way disappears and tell the face in the mirror So I've shared that if you were to listen to my iPod, this is probably amongst the most played artist on the uh, 2023 playlist. Love Andy Grammer. He's kind of a pseudo-Christian artist. He's got a lot of songs that wrestle with faith, and he's actually uh, got a few songs with some of my favorite Christian artists like Andy Mineo. Um, and just what a powerful song. To daily remind ourselves to look in the mirror, and no matter what doubt may come our way, what fear may come our way, remind ourselves that we have been born on purpose, with purpose, and for a purpose. You're not here by accident. You are here for a purpose. Amen? And for some of us, we begin to think, all right, maybe, maybe I've missed out on the opportunity to live into my purpose. Well, if you still have breath, you still have purpose. And for others of us, we might think, I've fulfilled my purpose. And praise God if you have, but for some of us, we're still living into the purpose that God has placed on our life. One of my favorite characters in the, all of the Bible is a character by the name of Jonah. Jonah is this really unique character who wrestled with fear and doubt. He didn't get up and look at himself in the mirror and go, I was born for this, because when God came excuse me, and called Jonah, instead of going, I've got this, he said, I'm out of here. He was filled with great doubt. And, fear. and I think Jonah is hyper-relational for you and I, because for some of us, we look at that as well, and we go, okay, maybe God is calling me to a particular place, a particular people, for a particular purpose, and yet we fear that we don't know enough, we're not talented enough, we're, we're not strong enough, we're not equipped enough, and we start to go through the enough list, enough in our minds that we begin to disqualify ourselves. But hear me, if God has called you to it, God will see you through it. 
You've been created on purpose with purpose. So let's look at Jonah's story and see how we can see ourselves in some of this. Let's look at this and see how we can understand the purpose that God has called us to. So if you have your Bible, we're in the book of Jonah. In the Pew Bibles, it's page 726. Page 726. We're going to look at the first uh, 17 verses, and I'm going to read and talk as we go through. Is that okay? So we'll have a little bit of a, a, a Jonah conversation. Starting in verse 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, get up, go, get, get going to Nineveh, that great. Now, y- y'all see that this morning, the word great. Great is used, I think it was somewhere between 14 and 17 times throughout the whole book of Jonah. It's a very important word, the word gadol, which is the Hebrew word for great here. It's very important. So arise, get up, get going to that great city and call out, preach, proclaim against it for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose, he, he listened to the first part of what God was calling him to do. God, Jonah got up, God said, go preach to Nineveh, and Jonah fled to Tarshish. He was trying to run from the presence of the Lord, so he went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into the ship to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah, in his mind, believed for a moment that if he ran away from where God was calling him to, he could flee the presence of God. What Jonah didn't understand is that God's presence was not locked in a specific place. God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present. There is no place that you can run to escape from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord God, verse 4, hurled a great tempest, is the old uh, English word there, a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest, again the same word, on the seas so that the ships threatened to break up. But the mariners were afraid and each cried out to their own God and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and he had laid down and he was asleep. There's a parallel here between Jonah's time on the boat and Jesus' time on the boat. You see, Jonah went down, Jesus went down. Jonah fell asleep, Jesus fell asleep. The people who were on the boat, who were fishermen by trade, both got afraid. The stories end very differently, though. For Jonah, they kept yelling and screaming, and they blamed each other until eventually they blamed him. For Jesus, he got up, and what did he do? He called for peace, and he got it. Jonah's in the midst of a very chaotic situation, and he doesn't understand where his peace comes from. So the captain came to Jonah and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper, arise? Again, there's that get up call, call out to your God, proclaim, preach, and perhaps the God, your God, will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the seas and the dry land. Could you imagine all these other folks? They worship little gods who have one job. This is the God of prosperity. This is the God of fertility. This is the God of the sky. This is the God of the land. And they have this pantheon of gods. And Jonah comes in and goes, I worship the one true God who made everything you see. He begins to shift the perspective of the people that he's with. 
Then the man... Um, Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and they said to Jonah, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may quiet down for us? Where will we find peace? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea, that the sea may quiet down For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. See, they they had the solution, but they were trying with their own might. I think some of us can understand that. God's given us some solutions, and yet we keep trying to go at it our own way. That's a different message for a different day. But they could not row hard enough to get back to dry land, for the sea grew more and more, there it is again, tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up, I mean just picture this, they pick him up, and they give it a one, whoo, and like over the boat he goes. They hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased raging in a moment. And because of that, the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered sacrifices to the Lord, and they made vows. And the Lord appointed, uh, here's that word again, a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And may God bless the reading of his word. You see, Jonah had a calling on his life for a purpose. His purpose was to get up and arise. He was in a place, and God was calling him to arise and to go somewhere else. He needed to get going to a particular place to be amongst a particular people. And as he got there, God gave him the mission of preaching a message of repentance. And what's interesting about all of this is, He was called to preach a message of repentance to the enemies of Israel. He was called to preach forgiveness to those who were far from the love of God. And we we can hear this sometimes and we think, oh, you know what, it's not all that bad. It must have been really easy. I mean, he just needed to go into a community that was, you know, kind of a little bit evil, but you keep hearing these words great. There's a comparison that the author wants us to hear. There's a a great city, Nineveh. There's a great evil. There's a, a great wind. And there's a great big fish. But all of them pale in comparison to the greatness of God. Jonah's being told to get up, go, get going, go preaching. Preach a message of repentance. So Jonah's called for a purpose. Not only that, Jonah is called to a place. He's called to go to Nineveh. A little bit of information about Nineveh. It's the oldest, it's one of the oldest cities in Mesopotamia. It's located on the eastern bank of the Tigris River. I have a map. Let's throw this up real quick and kind of get a picture. So on the far right-hand side of the, of the Mediterranean Sea, Close to Saudi Arabia, down there, you see Jerusalem. You guys tracking with me? So, Saudi Arabia, hang a left, go up a little bit. There's Jerusalem, there's Amman. Uh, You know what, I think I got another map. Let's go to the next map. There we go. So, what you see is uh, Judah, Israel, Syria. And on the left, you see Joppa. Now, Jonah, in the beginning of this, is in Joppa. He is called to go to the great city of Nineveh, which is up and to the right. If you look where Babylon is, and you go north, you see the word Assyria, and directly above it is Nineveh. It's kind of a journey, right? Now, Joppa is there on the easternmost point of the Mediterranean Sea. And Jonah desires to flee from the presence of the Lord because he's being called to Nineveh, which is northeast. 
Instead of going northeast, he gets in a boat and he heads as far west as he can go to Tarshish, which is believed to be modern-day Spain. So if you go back to the last picture, yep, right there. No, you were right. Yep, that one right there. So all the way to the right in the Mediterranean, where Jerusalem is in that area of Israel, is Joppa. And all the way over there on the farthest point towards Portugal and Spain is where Tarshish would be. In Jonah's mind, he's fleeing to the opposite ends of the world because their world was really just built around the Mediterranean Sea. Now, for a modern-day equivalent, that last picture that we haven't put up yet, it would be like fleeing from Washington all the way to San Jose. That's about the distance that Jonah is imagining that he can travel. But ultimately, what he's trying to do is he's trying to run away from the presence of God. But let's go back to Nineveh. Nineveh is one of the oldest cities in Mesopotamia. It's located on the eastern bank of the Tigris River inland. And in about 701 BC, Nineveh was made the capital of Assyria. Nineveh was the symbol of the overwhelming and ruthless power of that empire. Nineveh was at the time the most disturbing long-term threat to Israel's security and survival. Assyria and Israel did not get along. They were enemies. We hear from history about the way the Assyrians operated. We see that Jonah is called to this particular group of people, the Assyrians, and we find that about a century before Jonah's time, one of their kings, King Ashran Asir Paul, and I've totally butchered how to say the king's name, he wrote these words. You ready? I cause great slaughter. I destroyed, I demolished, I burned. They were known for burning their enemies alive. If you were lucky, you were just decapitated. If you were unlucky, they would, he goes on, I took the warriors prisoner and impaled them on stakes before the cities. Many of the captives I burned in fire. Many I took alive. From some I cut off their hands to the wrists. Others I cut off their nose, their ears, their fingers. I put out their eyes of many of the soldiers. I burnt their young men and their women to death. This is the words of the king a century before Jonah. So imagine for that period of time, from this king to Jonah, how much worse it got. We're told throughout this history the Assyrians would take Israelites amongst other enemies. They would take them down to the river and not for good things. They would bury them up to their neck at low tide and wait for high tide. They were people who tortured and punished Israel. They killed their people. They treated them with disdain and hate. And God comes to Jonah and he says to Jonah, go and preach to your enemies. You know, God gives us that same message today. Some of us have some people in our life that we don't like, that we don't agree with, that we're in confrontation with, that we're hostile towards. People who have hurt us both mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that, that have done great harm to us. And God tells you and I, just like he told Jonah, that right now is the time to go and offer forgiveness. But do we act like Jonah? I, I think some of us do. We get up, we go to Joppa, and we try to flee to Tarshish. Because if we run far enough away, maybe we won't have to obey God. And there's some of us today living in disobedience. Because you've been called to offer grace and forgiveness, and yet you're holding on to it. Now, offering forgiveness does not mean that you accept wrong that have been done to you. Forgiveness does not mean that you wash over the harm that has been done. Like, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness gives you the ability to free yourself from pain, to move forward and live into the calling, to the purpose 
that God has in your life. Jonah was called for a purpose. Jonah was called to a place. And Jonah was called to a people. You see, this morning, church, I truly believe that God is calling each and every one of us to a certain purpose. Maybe you feel that God's purpose in your life is something that you don't want. Maybe you want to run like Jonah. You you think, "I, I don't know. Maybe I can escape from God. Maybe I can run far enough away. Maybe I can ignore this purpose to offer grace, to offer life, to offer forgiveness, to offer hope, to offer help. Maybe you think that this is not your season for that, or you're not skilled enough for that, and you think maybe you can just run far from God, but hear me. You will never experience true fulfillment until you begin to live into who God is calling you to be. You will never experience true fulfillment until you let go and allow yourself to live into God's plans and purposes for your life. You've been created on purpose, with purpose, and for a purpose. And for some of us, today is the day we need to do a 180 and stop running for it, running from it. You know, Jonah's story is amazing in that you see him try to run as far away from God as possible. And Jonah views everything else as being so great. The city's great, the, 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 the storm is great, the fish is great, and he forgets how great his God is. But the beautiful thing in Jonah's story is that as he tries to run a thousand miles away from God, it's only one step back into the arms of the Savior. So for any of us who have been trying to run and we think that we've ran too far from the love of God, it's only one step to turn around and return back into the presence of a beautiful, loving Father. You can't outrun God. You can't outsin God's grace. You can't do those things to disqualify yourself from God's love. But we keep trying to run away. But maybe today is the day we need to turn around. See, God is calling you to a place. Maybe you feel that God's placed you here at such a time as this, and it's something you don't want. You look around and you go, I don't recognize the people around here anymore. I don't recognize my community anymore. The world is changing too fast. I, I, I don't know that this is the place that I'm supposed to be. And maybe you're wrestling with it. And for some of you, maybe you're right. Maybe God has a different place in store for you. But I would also say that for some of us, God has this place in store for you. You're right here on purpose. It's not an accident that you are joining us this morning for service. It's not an accident that you live in the house that you live in, on the street that you live in, with the neighbors that you have. No matter how you or do not like them. Maybe you're there to show them love and grace and hope. Maybe you're there to shine the light of Jesus brighter than anybody else could be because you live in such a place that you do because God has called you to that place. And not only has God called you to that place, but God has called you to a certain group of people. Maybe you feel that God has placed you around people that you don't want to be around. You look around and go, these people are weird. And yes, they are. And I'm the weirdest of them all, and I get that. Maybe you want to run like Jonah, but think about it. Maybe you say to yourself, I don't have anything in common with them. No, you do. We have the same love for the same Father. Hear me, your life can make an impact in the people that are around you. And for some of us, we keep fighting against it, we keep resisting it, but maybe today is the day that we get outside of ourselves and we start to get to know the family that's around us. And we realize that there's always more room at the table for someone else because the kingdom of God is bigger than any of us could ever imagine and there are people who need to know Jesus. So you have a purpose that's been placed on your life. You have a a place that you are called to, and you have a people that you are called to. So today, church, let me ask you this. Will you rise to the challenge to live into your calling, to fulfill your purpose in the place that that God is calling you amongst the people God is calling you to? Will you rise? Will you get going? And will you communicate for God? 
I know that for me in my life, it's not been the easiest journey sometimes to constantly get up, get going, and get preaching. But I look back on where God has called me from, and I look at who God is calling me to. There's so much more joy, there's so much more life, there's so much more hope when you live into the purpose and the calling that God has placed on your life. So church, God is calling each and every one of us to a purpose, to a place, and to a people. Will we respond with yes? Let's pray. Father, this morning it is my prayer that you would raise us up as your people to love this community well, because I know for each and every one of us, you've placed a purpose within our lives, and that no matter how young or old we might be, we still have the opportunity to flesh out our purpose. Lord, I know that we cannot escape you, but I know that we can at times ignore you, that we cannot measure up and not live into the purpose that you've placed on our lives, and when we do so, we ultimately miss out on true fulfillment. So help us to hear and help us to see where you are guiding us so that we don't miss out on truly experiencing the purpose you have for our life. God, help us to remember that this place that you've called us to is a place that is in desperate need of your love and grace and mercy. Grow within us a passion and a joy for the people that are around us so that we might live our lives as a representation of the gospel, and others might come to know how good you are because they've been impacted by us. So Lord, help us to arise, help us to go, and help us to obey. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.